tonight is all about Alex, uh, who is here to talk about uh, his debut novel, The Indigo Children. And um, I'll be leading the conversation for the first half of this uh, program, but then we will open it up to questions from the audience as well. Um, so why don't we get started? Uh, Alex, why don't you tell us more about yourself and how you uh, got started writing? <laughs> so, as I'm assuming everyone knows, my name is Alex Breggy. Um, I'm 17 years old, which makes me a teen author, which isn't unheard of, but it's not extremely common. Um, I started writing when I was really young. I think a lot of writers do this thing where you kind of make picture books and force your family to read them. That's something I did. Um, I, start, I wrote my first book when I was 12. Um, is that a book that I would publish? Absolutely not. <laughs> but it happened. I wrote it. I would give it to all my friends. We, they would edit it. And uh, there was a little trend in our middle school where people were making fan art of the characters. Um, so I think that's where I really started um, thinking of writing as like something I could do. Like I could make characters and people could make fan art and be fans of my stories like a lot of the stories I read. I think that's where that really started. Um, and yeah. Great. Um, so your book is The Indigo Children, mm -hmm. and um, I have read it, so I do know this answer, but for everybody else here, um, what does Indigo Children mean? <laughs> so an indigo child is a child who possesses a special ability, which can be as intense as having like telekinesis kind of powers, I guess some would think of it, and as mild as just being really driven and like really powerful and um, into um, being successful and things like that. Um, uh, indigo children can mean different things for different people and it's often used as an alternative for um, saying a child has certain uh, disabilities such as like ADHD and autism and things like that and yeah great that's the best description I have of that great. <laughs> and can you tell us about the book itself what's what is the story even about so the book is about um, a group of indigo children who are singled out by a scientist um, and he wants to take this group of children and make a kind of like superior group of children and make them run the world. Um, but he has some really dark ways of doing that that the kids aren't really um, a fan of. They don't want to like participate in his dark stuff. They want everyone to live happily. And so they end up kind of going against him and that is a really hard choice and really dangerous choice for them to make. And without you know spoiling the story for anybody could mm -hmm. you tell us more about the children themselves like who are these characters? So there's four main kids. Um, the biggest thing when I was making these characters is that I wanted to make characters that represented certain communities and kids that didn't have a lot of representation in books so far. So there's a couple kids with ADHD, a couple kids from some challenged, adverse home environments. Um, I'll go from oldest to youngest, I think it would be easiest because there's four main ones. The first one, her name is Mia. Um, she's 16 years old, a high school junior. She is super smart. She's in just about every advanced placement honors class she can. Um, she's tasked with having a lot of household responsibility. She has to take care of her siblings um, and things like that, which makes it just that much harder for her to be successful. Second, we have Ace, who's kind of your spitfire, stereotypical troubled kid. Um, but underneath all of that, he's sweet, he's caring, he's nurturing. Um, so even though he gets in a lot of trouble throughout the book, he's also one of the biggest forces in making a difference throughout the book. Uh, next we have Aiden. He is 11. He's a middle school student um, and he is kind of classic class clown. He's always pulling pranks, always telling jokes, kind of a big comedic relief. Um, super hyper, super energetic and he's one of the characters with ADHD. And the last one is Kate. She is a fifth grade girl. Um, also very hyper, very bouncy, uh, very sassy, which I find a lot of girls in that age group tend to be. Um, and she's another character with ADHD. I found it really important to have a male and a female character with ADHD because we often don't see females with that condition being represented, especially in the age group where the kids need to see themselves in it. In this age group, uh, young adult, we don't often have a lot of representation of that. Great. Were any of them your personal favorites? or? Inspired I feel by like <laughs> authors aren't supposed to pick favorites, <laughs> um, but so far the fan favorite is Ace. I, you know what? I, I was thinking if I had been asked, I would have said Ace. <laughs> yeah, 
between fans that are like of the book that I know closely and like online reviews and stuff, it's all Ace is a great character. We love yeah. Ace. We want more from Ace. So I'm gonna go with that answer because I don't think I'm supposed to pick favorites. Okay. <laughs> uh, I know you kind of started touching on the subject, but mm -hmm. what was your inspiration for creating? the story and these characters? So the original inspiration was to tell stories about kids who um, didn't have a lot of representation in the media and I had none of the other stuff plotted out. That was just the goal and I had no idea that it was going to turn out the way it did. I had none of the characters made, nothing like that. Um, and then slowly I think the idea of... I. Let me rephrase. I was learning about the Indigo Children and I found a ton of quizzes that were like how to tell if I'm an indigo child, how to tell if my child's an indigo child. And I was like, well, if it's truly scientific, what if there was something that could single out these children, like really identify who these children are, which ones are indigo children? And that brought me to the use of the solution in the book, which I can't tell you too much about without spoiling it. Um, but something that the scientist uses and um, then that scientist kind of grew. I made the characters, I made the plot and everything. But really what inspired it was I wanted to tell stories um, that would empower kids that aren't empowered in other literature that's out there. That's wonderful. Um, the end of this book leaves mm -hmm. things open <laughs> for a further stories with these characters. Um, how, how do you plan that out? Do you have a set idea in mind of how many books you want this to be? Do you have a grand story arc? Are you just seeing where things go? Um, so it's definitely going to be a series. Um, I have a vague idea of what I'm going to write next and what I want in the future, but I don't really have an idea on what connects those. Okay. Um, so the next thing that will come out in this series is I'm going to write standalone books for each character, explaining their life, um, how they deal with the challenges they're given, because I feel like the original goal of this book that I talked about before needs that kind of standalone type of thing so that kids who latch onto these characters can really feel represented and feel heard. Um, in, you can't really do that in a book with all of them, so that's why I'm doing individual books. After that, there will be a, se a sequel that happens directly after the events of this book. Um, there's going to be new locations, um, new characters, a lot of new conflicts. So that's already what I have planned for that. It's going to be super heavy, super crazy. So if you're into stuff like that, um, that's something to look forward to. Great. Um, so would you like to share a piece of your story? Do you want to do a reading right now? Yeah. yeah. Great. So I'm going to read the uh, first couple pages of the book. Um, so you can get an idea of what it is. I have books that um, you can purchase after, so I thought it would be nice for you to hear it before you think about that. All right. So this is Chapter 1, Fire in the Chemistry Lab. If there's anywhere you don't want a fire to start, it's a chemistry lab. Flammable chemicals fill the storage cabinets and students' desks waiting to ignite. Though it may seem intense to you and me, this fire was only the beginning of a trail of devastating events. For Mia King, today began like any other school day. She fought with her little sister over every task, but eventually got her out the door. Since they lived close to the school, they either had to walk or pay for the school bus. Most of the families in their apartment complex couldn't afford the fee, so Mia escorted all of the younger children. Their town was so small that all 13 grades attended the same school, which held less than 400 students. It was three stories high, not including the basement, and each floor acted as a separate school. The elementary school students were on the bottom floor, the middle schoolers were, well, in the middle, and the high schoolers were on the top. Though it was no private academy, Mia loved it. She was able to have strong relationships with her teachers and take any advanced courses she wanted to. Most schools' larger student body didn't allow for such lenience. Mia doodled on her lab sheet, praying for her final class to end. Though her wandering mind was thrown back into reality when a loud thud sounded from the opposite side of the room. When Mia looked up, she saw her teacher lying face down on the ground. Her peers began to drop like dominoes across the room, ending with her lab partner. Her muscles tensed as incoherent thoughts swarmed in her mind. After a moment, Mia broke from her temporary paralysis and rushed over to her teacher's desk. As she grabbed her teacher's flip phone and began to dial 911, flames crumbled, crawled up the wall in front of her. In fear, she dropped the phone, causing it to tumble into the flames. She, attempt, she attempted to come up with a solution, but as her brain grew more cloudy and the flames cornered her, she decided it was best to save herself. Mia ran into the hallway and down the back staircase. When she pushed open the heavy door, she discovered a group of younger students 
standing in front of her. There were a fifth grade girl, a sixth grade boy, and a ninth grade boy whose arm was enveloped in a blistering burn. And so that's all I'm going to read, leave you guys on a little cliffhanger. <laughs> that was great, thank you. Um, so we can't obviously spoil the story, so we have to change gears here and we're going to switch and talk a little bit more about your writing process. Um, so what is that process like? I was telling you earlier, um, you know, I've dreamed many times, I'm going to write a book and I never do it. So <laughs> how, how did you find the time to write this and what was the whole process like? So, um, frankly, I don't have a steady writing schedule. There's times when I write for like six hours a day for an entire week, and then there's times where I don't write for three months. Mm -hmm. um, most authors will tell you that they write like Monday, Wednesday, Friday from this time to this time. I'm not one of those authors. Um, I started writing the Indigo Children in November using a program called NaNoWriMo. Um, it's shortened for National Writers Month and it's kind of a challenge that a bunch of writers take on to write a whole book or more specifically 50,000 words in one month. Um, so we all get together, we um, write together, we have meetings, things like that to encourage each other. Um, I did not write 50,000 words in November. Uh, it took me a year to finish the book, but um, it was a really great start. I say I got about halfway through the original draft in that month, um, and that's especially impressive saying I didn't start writing till about halfway through November um, because of the plotting and all of that, which I feel takes a lot of the time. Um, now I try to write at least once a week, um, but sometimes when with writing you need to take a break and kind of let the idea marinate and then you can come back and write so much better than you could have um, without taking that break. So yeah, it's not a really set schedule, but I try to write pretty often. Do you have like a setup you have to have every time you write? Like I have my tea. <laughs> um, usually I write in the morning with my coffee um, or I'll go out and get a coffee. It doesn't, it's not needed, but usually there's a coffee next to me. <laughs> um, and I write at my desk with my computer. Um, that's really about it. I don't have anything special. Now, did you, um, when you were writing the story, were you thinking like characters first and build the story around it, or did the characters just kind of naturally happen? So it really was kind of jig jagged. I thought of the purpose of the story, then I thought of a couple of the characters, then I thought, oh, this plot works. I need to make more characters for that. And then as I wrote, um, I be got more of the plot and more plot twists. It originally wasn't supposed to be as plot twisty as it is, um, but I, as I wrote, I went, oh, I could add that. That would be really cool. That would get, put the readers at the edge of their seats. So I'd say it kind of happened, like, interchangeably. Sure. And your book is self-published, which is something most people, we don't know anything about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's very interesting to me. Can you tell us about that process? How do you even go about getting started? So my book is self-published through Amazon KDP and Ingram Spark. So Amazon KDP is Amazon Kindle Direct Publishing, um, and that publishes just through Amazon. Um, it does eBooks, paperbacks, and hardcovers, um, but only through Amazon. Completely free. All you have to do is um, format your manuscript correctly, which is the document you write the book in. Um, upload it create the cover, upload it. They have a cover designer. I didn't use that, though. I made it um, on a platform called Canva. Um, and you just upload it, make sure you have all your information. Um, they give you like an ISBN number and all of that stuff. And yeah, that one was the easier one. You just upload it, and then within a week, it's on Amazon. Um, the second one is Ingram Spark. That's the one that's used to put books on shelves, essentially. It, sells to wholesale retailers like Barnes & Noble, Target, Walmart, those. Um, it's, and it's on there, and then any one of those wholesalers that like wants copies of the book in their store, on their site, whatever may have you, uh, they buy through Ingram. So it's like that middleman. Um, that one's a little more challenging because you have to have your own ISBN identifier, you, which is the barcode. Um, they have a cover creator that I did use for the back of the books. Um, and that one took me a little longer, uh, but overall it really didn't take as long as it would have taken me to publish with an actual publisher. Um, 
And though I probably would go with a professional publisher going forward, I'm glad I had this experience because it gives me more control over where they're distributed and like I get to plan my whole book tour myself and that's why I'm here today. So that's great. Um, and you, you touched a little bit on that you're working on more books in this particular world. Are you working mm -hmm. on other projects too or are you sticking with these characters for a while? So I've got the plots of the coming books for this series um, out but I'm not actually working on that right now. Okay. I'm working on a completely different unrelated um, book. Um, that book is currently working title called The Uncovering of Us um, and it's a middle grade book aimed at ages 9 to 13 ish. Um, and it's about two best friends who are both transgender and they're kind of discovering themselves together and dealing with certain things that a lot of transgender youth deal with such as like family acceptance or not acceptance, bullying, um, hate that's directed at them at a young age which isn't fair and things like that. Um, and that's another audience. I think I have found a solid four books in that age group about transgender kids and with there being like transgender kids out there, they exist. Um, there needs to be more literature that re represents them. So that's why I put that story first over the stuff in the series because I thought that story needed to be put out first. Those kids need to be represented first before I move on with these. Uh, I don't know how you keep track. <laughs> like, <laughs> how how could you like jump between different stories? You just um, keep a lot of notes. Google Docs is my best yeah. friend, uh, and Google Drive. I've got like a folder that's novels, and then a ton of folders in there that's sure. like because uh, this series is called The Chronicles of the Star Children, so I've got that, and then I've got each individual book, and they've all got their own folder with all their documents in it. Um, so that's a very big one, and then also I don't know, they just all are kind of running in my brain twenty four seven. Uh, so sometimes I'll be like writing another story and I'll be doing like a mundane task. Like I'll be like vacuuming and then I think, oh my gosh, I should add that plot to that book I'm not even working on right now. Okay. So I don't know, they just kind of are there 24-7. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we've been talking about um, what you're writing, but what sort of books are you reading? Or do you have favorite authors, favorite characters? So I thought about this a lot and I have a lot of favorite books. I don't think a lot of books I come across and actually finish I dislike because if I don't like a book I don't really give it to time of day. Um, a couple of the authors that inspired me to become an author were Rick Riordan who wrote the Percy Jackson, Hairs of Olympus, Magnus Chase books. He just came out with a new one. He's got like 25 books. Um, all for the middle grade young adult audience. Um, and I think that <laughs> he inspired me a lot because he was one of the first authors to really say that kids with learning disabilities um, could use those traits that are from that learning disability as something powerful. And in his books, that's like what, that's one of the criteria that makes you a demigod. Um, and so a lot of kids with those diagnoses found a lot of um, comfort in that. And so that inspired me a lot to write for that audience. And then another one just like that is um, Alex Gino, who wrote the books Melissa and um, Rick, I believe, which are both about LGBT youth. Um, and I think he's probably one of the only authors out there that's like New York best time, New York Times bestseller in that age group for books that feature LGBT um, kids. So that is really cool. And I also actually spoken with that author like on the internet via email, um, and they're very uh, nice about giving like tips and giving reference material and things like that. So um, I really like to support authors that are like me and really interact with the audience and other writers and try to build like a good community of writers who are writing diverse literature. Do you have any advice for anybody else out here that might be interested in writing? So I could talk for hours about advice I have for <laughs> writers. Um, so I'll tell a couple of my main tidbits. Um, the first one is that I feel personally if you're going to write a story, and this doesn't count if you're writing a story for you or your, for your family, this mainly counts if you're writing a story to put out in the world. Um, you should always have a purpose for your story. Why are you writing this story? And why is it different from other stories that are already out there? Why would people want to pick up your book and read it? How is it helpful? And I think that not only takes away a lot of the um, writing that can sometimes be harmful to communities when authors write about communities they're not part of um, and use things like stereotypes and things like that without even knowing it. When you ask, is it helpful or harmful to my audience, that can really take all that away. 
Another thing is that if you know from the get-go what your um, purpose of telling the story is, then you can market it that way, you can tell people about it that way. It makes it that much easier to summarize it, to write it, all of that stuff. Um, and then my other tidbit of biggest advice is for editing. And it's that you have to take breaks before when you write and when you edit. If you try to edit something that you're honed in close on the project on, it's just not going to work. You're going to miss things. You're going to be too harsh on yourself. There's going to be all sorts of things that just don't work. But if you step away from the project and you're able to view it like a reader, I usually take a couple months. I know some authors only take about a week. Um, and then you can edit it from that way. It just goes so much smoother. So those are my biggest two pieces of advice. But if anyone has specific questions for anyone's writers, um, you can feel free to ask at the end. Yeah. Actually, uh, we can open it up to questions now. So if anyone has a question. Yeah. What's uh, your question? I'm a huge writer, and mm -hmm. sometimes I'll be walking in the woods or something, and I'll see something, and I'll be like, hmm, that'll be a good part in my story. Does that happen to you? That happens to me all the time, especially with um, interactions with people. Actually, a little tidbit um, to the book. There is a part that mentions McDonald's, and I can't give you any more information than that. But one of the kids' McDonald's orders is actually my nephew's McDonald's order, because I thought it was funny, and you'll see how it's funny in the book. But we had that interaction, and, and then when I was writing, I was saying, wow, that would be so great for this character. And so I think it happens with that, and then also just, yeah, nature, settings, things like that. Also, sometimes I just think of things in my head randomly that aren't associated with my surroundings at all. Um, so yeah, I think that happens to me a lot. Yes? How did you come up with your character names? So I particularly am very picky about my character names. I know a lot of writers aren't. Um, most of my character names are either because I saw it and I was like, that's perfect, and I just gave them their name, or it has a very, very specific meaning. Um, so I do a lot of research on like looking up like girls' names and I go to all the baby name sites and then I find a name I like and fits the character and then I research what its meaning is, what its origin is. Does it fit my character from where they're from? Does it fit who they are? And things like that. Yes, in the back. Yeah, I think that's a challenge for a lot of us, um, is not having time to write. A lot of times, um, I honestly get a lot of my writing done when like plans get canceled, um, because I was already <laughs> prepared to like have an eventful, productive night. So then I'm like, oh, well, I will spend that writing. Um, another thing that some people do is you can schedule it. Like if you have a super busy schedule, maybe you can schedule right before bed, I'm going to write for one hour or for 20 minutes and or even if it's like 10 minutes it might not seem like a lot at first but over time putting that 10 minutes a day will really build your story any other questions yes Yeah, I do that a lot, especially with characters that I'm trying to make very diverse. A lot of times I will use other medias as inspiration because there's not a lot out there, right? Um, and so yeah, I think I do that quite a lot. Um, the biggest thing with that though is you have to make sure you're not copying. Um, because if you're writing a book about a similar plot with a similar character, someone might read that and be like, you didn't think of that, even if you did. So you have to make sure there's something that gives your character that extra flair, that extra thing that makes them them, and not the character they're based off of. Any other questions? Yep. Did you ever use outlines when you started thinking of a plot? Yes, but I tend to use a different outline for every book. Um, I do not stick to one, so I can't suggest one. The book I'm writing right now, I already had a bunch of ideas for. I already knew how it was going to start, how it was going to end, what the main climax was going to be, which is not the case when you usually start first writing a book. So um, for that one, I was able to just create a box with chapter numbers and um, write a summary of what each chapter was going to be. Uh, with the Indigo Children, I kind of plotted beginning, middle, um, epilogue, and I mean end and then epilogue. Um, 
just like basic things I wanted in there and then I went in each chapter and then I went in each part of the chapter. That one was kind of me making my own outline, um, but there isn't one baseline outline I use, no. Any other questions? Yes? Do you, do you do a lot of research? It depends on the story. Um, for this story, just to begin writing it, I had to do a bunch of um, extensive research on not only indigo children, but also um, ADHD in children, how it's presented. Um, a little fun fact, when I first wrote this book, there was two whole other kids that just didn't make it past the drawing board. They were in it for the first half. They were just too much. Um, I ended up cutting them. One of them will appear way later on in the series, but um, I did a lot of research for them. One of the kids had OCD, um, so I had to do a lot of research on childhood OCD and how that presents. And even though he ended up getting cut, um, that was a lot of research I did. did. Were you sad when you got him cut? I was. It was ended up being too much, and like uh, the interactions didn't seem steady and authentic with the other characters. Like I felt like the character was a little too like bouncy and not real enough. Um, and there was originally six kids, which was just kind of too much to write uh, about six kids all at once, especially with such an invested plot that this book has. It's a crazy plot. So having six kids in that group was too much. So I ended up cutting, but yeah, uh, they'll still all live in my heart for sure. <laughs> yes? Mm -hmm. And I'll start one, and then I'll never finish it. Yeah. <laughs> I have a lot of unfinished stories. Me and my friend counted them the other day, and I think I had 15 stories in my Google Drive right now that are started or that are plotted or something that are just not finished. Um, so I think a lot of people struggle with that. Um, is there a certain thing that like stops you from finishing writing it? Do you just move on? Okay. And um, <laughs> it's basically about a girl battling a wall. Okay, mm -hmm. we, we don't want details. Mm -hmm. And I never got to like, I got a bunch of it done, but I didn't get to the ending. Yeah, I think the ending is a challenge for everyone. Um, I watched a ton of YouTube videos about writers, how to end your book, how to write an ending, extensive. The ending was definitely the hardest part of this book. Um, and it's because how do you wrap up everything that you've just written? How do you end it? And for mine, how did I end it in a way that made people happy but left a cliffhanger, but not too much of a cliffhanger because I'm going to put it on the back burner for a year. It was a really um, hard thing to write. Uh, but eventually, one day, I took a break from it. That's a big thing. I took a break from the story. I said, I'm going to take a break from writing for about a month um, and then wait for it to come to me or I'm going to come back in a month and think really hard about it. I just took a break from it. And then during that break, I thought of the entire ending scene. I think I was like laying in bed one night. It wasn't anything special. Um, and I thought of the whole ending scene. So sometimes you just have to take a break from it. Yes? Do you ever base stories off of your dreams? Not my dreams, my experiences, there's definitely, there's always going to be a little bit of my friends, my family, my life in the stories you write, um, but not my dreams so much, no. But I know a lot of authors do do that. Two things. Do you, like, sometimes write about your interests? So, like, one day I'll be really interested in, like, trees, mm -hmm. and I'll write about a tree. Do you ever do that? Um, I think I do sometimes. That's a lot of what I'll write short stories from time to time, or I'm also very into writing screenplays. Um, and I a lot of times will write those kind of things about my interests. Um, I think that's a lot of what like blogging writers do. They tend to do is more interest-based stuff. Um, but I'm interested in all the stuff I write about because it's all about kids, and which I work with kids, and it's also um, about like certain communities that I want to know more about and I want to feel represented. So they're very interesting to me as well. So I think to a degree, yes, um, and to a degree, no. And my second thing, what inspired you to just like even have the thought of writing about an indigo child? Um, like I said before, I wanted to write a story about kids with learning disabilities and from adverse home environments, um, meaning like homes that are challenging um, and have like some hard situations in them. Um, and so I knew that and then 
I knew about Indigo Children, and I think I was on Pinterest, honestly, and I came across one of those quizzes. And so that's when it really clicked, and I was like, I should write a story about the Indigo Children. That's how I'm going to put together all of these ideas I have all at once. So I think it was just an idea of I wanted to write about them, and then the topic of Indigo Children is what pulled them all together. Yes? Um, so I noticed you said you were going to like, write kind of individual stories about the four main characters. Um, I think that's a great idea, um, and I'm hoping this isn't spoiling it at all. I'm trying to think about it in my head, make sure I don't spoil it. But that sequel that's coming out after the standalones, the situation they're in is going to explain Mr. Burrell, the scientist's um, entire backstory. Um, so he kind of, in a way, will be getting his own standalone too, but in his, there'll also be Climax, there'll also be all the kids, and all sorts of stuff like that. So you will get that um, just a little more down the line. Any more questions? Yes. Who edits your book? I edit my books. Um, <laughs> I had a lovely, lovely set of beta readers, um, which beta readers are people who read your book before it's been released. And I feel so bad to all my beta readers because the original draft of this book is nothing like the final book. It was poorly formatted. It was in a weird font. It was in a weird spacing. Uh, it was, it didn't have like four of the chapters it has now. It had two really weird chapters in it. It was a whole thing. Um, but I sent that out to them and they were able to give me feedback. One of my beta readers um, who's mentioned in the acknowledgments of the book, her name is Kaylee Varley. She actually took it upon herself to um, go through the entire book. She printed it out and she um, annotated it, uh, edited it with a pen because she's a teacher. Um, and so that was super helpful for me. And then after that was just months of rereading, editing, rereading, editing, putting it in text to speech. Oh, that sounds weird. I should reword that. So yes, I edit publish and write all my stuff. There's no um, outside sources except for those beta readers, which I was so lucky to have a nice crowd of them. Do you ever like, use a dictionary to get like, juicier words in your story? I use Google. Um, I'll think of a word that I want to use, and then I'll say, OK, I'm going to put that word with synonym after it. And then I go through thesaurus.com, and I look at synonyms for an hour until I find the right word. Um, yes, I do that probably every couple paragraphs when I'm writing. <laughs> And an hour is an exaggeration, but yes, I always am looking for the best word for a situation. Uh, sometimes I even ask my friends, like last night actually I was writing a story and one of the characters' sister, I, she has very, what we decided at the end was poofy hair, but I didn't, couldn't think of the word for poofy, so I, I got in our Discord channel and I said, hey guys, what's the best word for this hair? And I gave a lengthy explanation and then they all gave their words and I was like, perfect. So. That is a big challenge with writing, is trying the right word. But yes, I use Google mostly for that. Any other questions? Yeah, uh, Robert Block, who wrote uh, Psycho, mm -hmm. he used to tell a story where he said, when he grew up in the Depression, mm -hmm. he quickly figured out that he had two choices. He could work for a living or he could starve. And he said that he decided to become a writer so that he could try both. <laughs> I guess the, the question I have for you is, do you see this as a, as like a profession, this is what you're going to do full time as, a, as an adult, or do you just see it as maybe a, you know, a, a, I would say a hobby, but you know, a side one? I see it as a profession, and actually next year I'm going to be um, attending Bennington College for creative writing. Um, so I am really, I know that not, that making it as a big writer is a hard thing to do. It's up there with like being an actor nowadays. Um, but I'm hoping that I can be one of those people um, and I'll build my skills and try my best to kind of get into the market. Um, and if worse comes to worse, I can work as an editor. I can work in the book yeah. business and not be a best-selling author and still write on the side. So I would hope it's going to be my career full-time. Um, that's what we're going for. <laughs> yes. I do want to. Actually, I do have the beginning of the screenplay for The Indigo Children written. Um, I did a project over last, I think it was like the 
and it, it, winter ish, spring ish, somewhere in there. It was one of those kind of in between months um, where I went on this site called Backstage. They were doing this thing where you could post a um, acting listing for free and have people do your work. And so I posted this thing and I was like, hey, anyone who hasn't been doing anything since the pandemic, all you actors out there that are stuck in your house, um, I have this screenplay for this book I'm writing. I would love to see the characters come to life. And so I got a ton of submissions of people just like having fun with the script I gave them. Um, so that is out there. I was thinking about maybe one day collaging that and putting that on my YouTube channel for the book so you guys could see kind of the characters come alive and see kids having fun with the book. Um, so yeah, if that's something that the audience is interested in, that's something that might happen soon. It's called Write the Bullet. Um, everything I have is called Write the Bullet. And at the end, I have these cards over here that have that on it. They have my Instagram, my Facebook. I know that's probably more for the older generation here um, than you oh, youngins. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm just saying, I don't think these kids have Facebook. <laughs> I wouldn't want them to. Um, but it has all my social medias, and then I have a website that has all of that on it. So if you take one of those cards, you can type in the website when you get home with parents' permission and see all the stuff I have. Any other questions? So you know that another book has been written. Um, it's a factual book by Lee Carroll and Jan Tober mm -hmm. that's called The Indigo Children. See, I did extensive research because I thought it was too base bone of a title to ha not have another book, and that never came up in my research. Mm -hmm. uh, there was all sorts of books called The Indigo Children and with a ton of things at the end, like The Indigo Children and Their Stories or The Indigo Children and Where They Are Now, things like that. But I was like, okay, I'm confident that this doesn't exist. As soon as I published it, found it. So I'm aware now. I was not aware. I did so much research, so many search engines. I went in incognito on Google just to make sure and nothing came up and then it did when I published. So I think that can be that situation a lot of people can relate to in different ways though where things don't happen until you do the thing that they contradict. <laughs> <laughs> so. There are many books with similar titles. If not same, same titles. Title. Yes. Exactly. Many, many. <laughs> but it, I, I have a statement first which is thank you, thank you, thank you. I think mm -hmm. this is so important, your audience. Yes. Um, but also the point of the purpose of your book is very different um, and I think can just hold its own mm -hmm. because the title is one thing but the purpose of your book to me is extremely yes. important and on time. So, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. I think another thing that sets it apart from the books that um, have the same title or similar titles too is they're all nonfiction. Mm -hmm. This is technically a fiction story, mm -hmm. um, fictional characters, real concept kind of thing. Um, and another thing is the audience. Uh, this is for mainly directed at teenagers, um, older preteens. It's 12 and up is the age group I give it. Um, and but the it is set in 2005, so a lot of like kind of young adults and older adults are like, oh, we can relate to this time, we can relate to um, the story on a different level. So I think it is for anyone, but its main audience is the younger people to relate to the characters and feel heard and seen in the story. So I think that the whole TikTok thing places mm -hmm. apart from the rest of the world, and I think mm -hmm. of the transgender, uh, what they're going to write is a really good idea. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Just a question. When you were young, did you have a vivid imagination? Yes. <laughs> My mom is actually in the back, and she can very much so attest to that. I would stare at the wall for hours and just daydream. Um, I had imaginary friends. Basically, the most like active imagination you can think of as a kid, I had. I was thinking of stories. Like I said in the beginning, I was writing books about like dogs and dolphins. I vividly remember um, like being friends and uh, forcing my family to listen to that. Um, so, yes, I had a very, very active imagination as a kid. Me too. <laughs> I think I still have a very vivid active imagination. Um, it's just a little more honed down now. Um, but it's definitely still there. I think most writers do. So would you I mean, consider what I call heightened awareness, in other words, of your environment, that you're able to, when you walk in the room, not only do you see straight ahead, but kind of panoramic. 
Yeah, and I think a lot of writers relate to that too, is we kind of see everything not only as what I'm experiencing, but what everyone else is experiencing and everything else that could happen in this given moment. It's more, the best way I can describe it is it's more of a third person view than a first person view. And that's with writing for people who don't know. First person is telling it like, my thoughts, me, my experience, and third person is what this book's written in, in, is like a narrator telling the story. So I think that um, a lot of writers and creatives in general that create stuff tend to see it in a third person, not only um, how is, am I affecting the environment I'm in, how are other people, how is everyone feeling instead of just how I'm feeling, but also how can I use this in my book is another thing that a lot of writers do. <laughs> So outlining and templates and stuff like that can help that a lot. Um, and when you write, what I do is I write out everything in a separate doc, completely unprofessionally, completely summarized all the ideas. And then from there, I'm able to say, this piece that I thought of doesn't really impact the story. It doesn't really help. So I can take that out um, and things like that. Um, some ways you can do that is write like, chapter one and then a summary of chapter one and then chapter two a summary of chapter two and so on through the whole book. Another way you can do it is you could write um, the beginning. I want this to all happen in the beginning. I want this to happen in the buildup. I want this to happen um, during the climax, during the big scene. And then I want this to happen when everything's dying down and this to happen at the end. Um, I think that writing it all out on a separate document or a piece of paper is really helpful because you get all the ideas out and then you can kind of mix them around. Like, oh, maybe this would work better in the beginning. Oh, we should do that in the beginning because it would get to know the character better. So I think that the biggest tip for that is just writing everything out before you actually start writing the story. Any other questions? Great. Okay, well, Alex is going to be here signing books, or um, you can purchase books from him, and you can ask questions as well then. Um, but let's all say thank you for yeah. joining us. It was wonderful. <laughs> thank you. And thank you to everyone for coming. Um, for books, I have hardcover and paperback, and I take cash or most mainstream credit cards. Great. Thank you very much, and thank you everyone for coming out. <laughs>